This is the most extravagant project I've ever been a part of as far as scale. Wrangling all these old war birds that haven't been assembled, really, probably since the Korean War. I mean, it's just unbelievable. We were operating 70-year-old aircraft that are normally museum pieces. It felt like we were at war with them. And we get so low, and I'm in the plane. We're so low, and we're going whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. I mean, we're just going, and the plane's going whack, 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 whack. And you can feel it, boom, 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 boom. And the earth is moving around you. <laughs> The war shots are just epic. There's really no other way to describe them. You don't feel like you're just watching a big war movie with big explosions. You feel like you're sitting right next to the guy that's getting shot at or shooting. And even in the sky, I mean, it's you feel like a bird. The inspiration for Devotion came back in 2007. I was a young journalist at a, uh, a veterans convention in Washington, D.C. And I saw this gentleman across the lobby of the hotel. It was Captain Tom Hudner. And I went up to him and I said, Captain Hudner, I'd love to interview you someday and maybe tell your story. And uh, that led to a seven-year collaboration that resulted in a movie. I ordered the book and I happened to bring it on a family fishing trip. And a bunch of my family happened to be reading the book. And we all read it and we're like, oh my gosh, this story, this is incredible. After that, I looked into the rights, which were taken at the time. And then I just happened to run into the guy who had the option at a party and I brought up devotion and he had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> and I was like, if I did something with it, would you have a problem with that? He's like, no. So I emailed Adam <laughs> and I was like, hey, here's the situation. I want to make your book into a movie. And so I drove to uh, Concord, Massachusetts and spent the weekend with Tom Hudner and his family. At the end of that weekend, uh, I got their blessing and I promised them that I'd make this movie and make it right. Gents. This is Tom Hudner. We were in Pensacola together. Hell of a stick. Hell of a pretty face, too. Almost too pretty. You boys sound lonely. <laughs> Welcome to VF32. I brought the story, the book, to Rachel Smith, and Rachel really, really ran with it and really spearheaded it. And she and her, her sister Molly um, have been so aggressive with this, and especially involving their dad, Fred, um, who also served and is so passionate about the story and knew Tom Hudner and knew the story. And I've never met any two people that got along faster than Adam Makos and Fred Smith in terms of talking about naval aviation, especially this time in American history. There's, let's say, 10,000 books published a year. Black Label Media could choose any of them. And so for them to say for Rachel Smith and Molly Smith, and the Luck and Bill brothers to say, this is the one we're gonna invest our time in. That's a big moment. We ship out next week. Look forward to having you on board. My writing partner and I had adapted a number of period books for studios, and so that's kind of what we were known for. I read the book over a weekend and I knew this one was different. When I heard about JD, I, I got a call and they said, we found our director. He was looking for an aviation project. And so you're kind of on pins and needles. Who is it, who is it, who is it? And then they said his father was a Blue Angels pilot. I felt like this weight lifted because to do this movie, you have to have lived this story. The funny thing about just my relationship with this movie is my earliest memories are all surrounding aviation. Quite literally, my first memory is burning my hand on the nose of an F-18 Hornet after an air show, a show that my dad had just been a part of. He was a Blue Angel for two years when I was super, super young. So just like Navy bases, the smell of jet fuel, like that whole world are like all tied to my earliest memories. His passion for this story was unrivaled. He was our admiral. You want to be able to have someone who knows the world and who is as committed to telling this story as authentically as possible. I, I can't be more grateful that it's JD that we have at the helm of this to be able to guide us in honoring all of these people. Three, two, one, go! I think authenticity is very important on a movie like this because you're designing a world that's very real. I noticed really early on the Korean War is actually not a war that has found its way to screen that often. 
Part of what made production on this movie so complex is that we sourced nearly a dozen period aircraft. The goal was to shoot real airplanes and as many real airplanes as we can. And when we can't shoot all the airplanes real, make sure that all the ones that are big and front frame, those are real airplanes doing what real airplanes would do. I don't think are more than a dozen Corsairs still flying uh, in the world. And I think at our busiest time, we had five of them. Not only do we have to go source the right aircraft, which are rare, we're talking, you know, 67-year-old aircraft worth four and a half million dollars, these Corsairs. And then we had to paint them so that they looked like the Fighting 32s, VF-32 Squadron. We want people to watch this movie and go, I feel like I'm looking back in time. If you're gonna restore an airplane like this, you're gonna make it look really pretty and nice. These were warbirds, they were on ships, they were not pretty. The type of paint they were painted with originally didn't have any shine or luster beyond a few days. Crew chiefs used to have to do tricks like rub hydraulic fluid on the paint to get it to smooth out. That they claimed it would give them a couple extra knots of speed. We had to age all these airplanes to look appropriate to what they would actually look like sitting on the USS Leite. Anybody who loves aviation is gonna be obsessed with this movie. We have Bearcats, Corsairs, Sea Fury, uh, a Sikorsky helicopter, the HO-3S, which is the first helicopter in the Navy. That helicopter is a very special helicopter. It is the oldest flying helicopter in the world. There's only one of those that is in flyable condition. The only other one I know that looks like that is sitting in the Smithsonian. Alex, who owns that helicopter, he's uh, a pilot that we work with all the time. He's a Blackhawk helicopter pilot. He served in the Army, two tours. He was also a Sikorsky test pilot. It was a side passion project for him to find that helicopter, to refurbish it, to build it, and he built it to fly it. So to have a reason to come fly it, it, it didn't take much talking him into it. Say hello to the F4U Corsair. Threw the hog a little after the war, but the Navy's gone and made him fatter and meaner. Early on, what we tried to crack with them, you know, is what can we do that Top Gun couldn't? It's really comparing types of planes and types of maneuvers and where they have F-18s that can travel four times faster than our Corsairs. Maybe in that difference, there, there are, there's actually a new aesthetic we can find. Black Label uh, was, was pretty clear that they wanted to use the same methodology that Mike Fitzmaurice and I used on Top Gun, which was uh, practical airplane shooting from jets and helicopters and even drones and ground camera positions, but putting camera mounts on aircraft and putting the actors in the aircraft. From the very beginning, we knew we had to do that. There's something very visceral and real when an audience watches actors in a real aircraft. And one thing we were able to do with Kevin and, and, and Fitz was like, really be close to the Corsair. When you're not worried about jet blast, when you're not worried about all of these other things that come from the modern aircraft, it lets you do something a little different. And, and you know, as you'll see in the film, I mean, there, there are moments where we take the F4U Corsair, you know, to 200 miles an hour, 10 feet over the water, and Kevin and Fitz are flying 10 feet away from it in the Cinejet. We put together an aircraft that was a two-seat aircraft on this movie so that Glenn and Jonathan could actually fly in these aircraft and act in the back seat. We had cameras mounted facing them, and uh, they were in there pulling G's and ripping around feet off the deck doing 230 knots. That's real. It's something that you can't copy in a studio on a gimbal. When you're flying that fast and that low, you can't recreate the shadows, the sun, and the way the ground is on a plane, and, and then when you pull up, the G-force that is literally making you age 20 years in seconds, that's not something you can recreate. And we're hearing the roar, and we're dealing with the, with the, with the mics and the helmets and the Gs as, you, as, as you're moving, you know, how much you've got to hit it to go, you know, and then how to keep your shit together when you're coming back around. Like, all of that is invaluable, and those things are not just training, uh, but it's preparation uh, for, for telling the story. We're taking a slight detour on the way home. 
Try to keep up. We put a program together, kind of a mini devotion uh, flight academy, if you will. Glenn is already an aviator. He's a pilot, so he was a, a bit advanced, so we kind of started him later in our program. But uh, for Jonathan, he started in a Cessna 172, and he became acclimated with all things aviation and flying the airplane. You know, we got him to the point where he's in there pulling sustained G's and he's he's doing loops and rolls and uh, he went through that whole thing. So by the time we got him here and we put him in a, you know, a thoroughbred fighter, he was ready. That's a door ahead. I spent about two weeks learning the inside of it, how to move in it seamlessly, safety of it, and then also like the physical taxation that it takes. There were multiple days I would go up, I would come down, and I would go back to bed. And then, then I'd wake up and it'd be time to go up again. And what we did allowed me to have so much more respect for any aviator. It is a unnatural thing. One, it starts feeling natural. Like once you start getting the hang of it, it's very addictive. The amount of adrenaline, how loud it is, what a gift to actually experience that. Ready, set, hit it!